Hello from SDCC 2020 at home. Welcome to our panel, The Living Dead, celebrating the legacy of George Romero with co-author Daniel Krauss and Suzanne Romero. I'm Richard Newby, contributor for The Hollywood Reporter and an avid horror fan. George A. Romero invented the modern zombie with Night of the Living Dead in 1968, creating the monster that has become a key part of pop culture. Romero often felt hemmed in by the constraints of filmmaking. To tell the story of the rise of the zombies and the fall of humanity the way it should be told, Romero turned to fiction. Unfortunately, when he died, his last masterpiece, The Living Dead, was incomplete. Enter best-selling author Daniel Krauss. A lifelong Romero fan, Krauss was honored to be asked by Suzanne Romero to complete The Living Dead, and the two are here today to talk about his new novel, which is as much a tribute to George Romero's legacy as it is a gift to his countless fans. Welcome, Daniel and Suze. Hey, hi. Thank Thanks. Uh, Daniel Krauss is a New York Times bestselling author who writes for all ages. His books include the young adult thriller, Bent Heavens, The Teddy Saga, Troll Hunters, which was adapted into the Emmy-winning Netflix series, and The Shape of Water, co-authored with Guillermo del Toro, based on the same idea the two created for the Oscar-winning film. He was selected by the Romero estate to finish the epic final work from George A. Romero, The Living Dead, which will be released from Tor Books in August. Suzanne Romero is producer and founder and president of the George A. Romero Foundation. Thank you both for being here today. Hi. Hey. All right, let's dive in. So, uh, Suze, what can you tell us about George's writing of The Living Dead and how you came to ask Daniel to work on the project? Uh, you know, George, uh, George loved to write, so he uh, was constantly writing, and uh, he was writing this story, um, and he would do it, uh, you know, intermittently, um, you know, in between stuff, and... Um, uh, and, and he got a, a, a fair distance, but he didn't finish it. So um, uh, he, he passed, and um, you know this was early on, um, right, Dan? I mean, it was like uh, I don't know a few a month maybe afterwards. Uh, my manager, Chris Rowe, uh, suggested that uh, we contact a friend, and it was Dan and uh to talk about maybe finishing the book and um and dad was gracious enough to consider it and accepted the accepted the offer and uh, it, it's been a fantastic voyage ever since yeah i mean it, i more than just was gracious to accept it it was you know not i wouldn't even call it a lifelong dream because it's was beyond something that i would have ever dreamt you know, George meant everything to me growing up. So, uh, of course, I said yes. You know, I, I, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't imagine a project that I would want to work on any more than this one. I imagine that the writing process for this was pretty unique. So, how did you get into the headspace of George Romero? Well, there were sort of uh, multiple steps to it. Uh, you know, it, it's weird because it felt more like a collaboration, a standard collaboration, and I've done a couple of those, uh, than you would have expected. Because segments of the manuscript came in, uh, came at different stages, sort of unexpectedly. There was the initial chunk of pages that uh, George had written. And then, you know, after I was, you know, a few hundred pages into the work, uh, we turned up sort of another hundred pages that George had written earlier that was in some ways, almost a dry run for the book that had been sort of lost to time. We found that. Um, we also found a uh, missing short story that was told from the point of view of a zombie, which was really valuable to uh, get a sense of uh, the real zombie rules. And, you know, the book does have, for the first time, a real zombie point of view kind of character. And then lastly, and, I, and again, at this point, I'm hundreds of pages into the book, so this is a real pain in the ass, but a great one. We, uh, we found uh, about a 10-page letter that George had written that plotted out I mean, the, mis the uh, sort of hanging strands of the plot. Uh, so then I had to suddenly sort of retrofit a bunch of stuff and, 
and do some really interesting work about can this character be this character, can these two characters swap? And then secondly, of course, was just the research part. Um, so this was obviously watching all of his films yet again, uh, reading every interview and watching every interview that I could find about him. He was a very humble guy, but every once in a while, one of the interviews, he'd let a hint of his sort of grander ambition get through. Listening to commentary tracks, obviously, uh, reading every bit of scholarly yeah. analysis that I could, side projects he did, introductions to other books, comic books. And eventually I was able to create a timeline of his films, which was which is more puzzling than it would seem. It's not chronological. If you ignore the decade shifts between the films uh, and just look at how far each film is from the zombie outbreak, you get a really curious, uh, so in the author's note of the book, you find out that the actual sequence of the films are night, diary, survival, dawn, land, day. So it's 68, 2007, 2009, 1979, 2005, 1985, all mixed up. But once I, I had a sense of what's the first through sixth point, I could sort of begin to map out, all right, what would be the seventh through 15th point? Mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to sort of game out where he was going with zombies. And then finally, one of the absolute most important things I did was I interviewed Suze. Um, I met her in, in Toronto and we had a long interview where I learned about George's politics and his concerns and you know where he was going with the idea of zombies and his work and you know how he lived and how he died and what he loved and what he loved became very important to the book um Suze gave me a long list of the music he loved the films he loved and i studied those and those were critical i studied what george loved so that i could be inspired by what he was inspired by uh, and for example, his favorite film, The Tales of Hoffman, I was able to use that film as a scaffolding to build, you know, that, 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 that opera, The Tales of Hoffman, is a three-act structure. So I was able to use that as a model for the book three-act structure and a thematic guide for each act. So there's a, there was a, I treated it like I was working on an unfinished Rembrandt. You know, I took it very seriously. Um, so does this new novel, does it take place uh, within the continuity of the uh, prior six films? Yeah. So the, the book is sort of three acts. And so the, um, the second act, which is the shortest by far, sort of is where, you know, it's maybe this part. Uh, it's sort of where the films live. So there's his films night through, uh, well, all six of his films took place, took us basically five years out from the zombie origins. And so those five years are covered in that shorter section. So there's some important stuff there, but the idea is watch the movies and you, you'll, you we already covered that in a way. Uh, Romero has quite a large fan base uh, and I'm included in that. So uh, what do you think that uh, fans will be really excited about in terms of this new novel? Other than the fact that of course it is a new novel co-written by George Romero. Um, I is this for me first of all? Either, either. Uh, well, I'll go first, and then so you can add to it if you want. I think you know the stuff that they'll it, to some degree the, the stuff that they will expect will be there. There's sharp, even brutal commentary on American society that I don't think has ever been more poignant and cutting than it is right now. Um, you know, a lot of stuff about the haves versus the have nots. And, you know, it, the book involves a pandemic situation that we can get out of, but only if we work together. I think uh, those are sort of the, the big picture ideas. I think some of the, you know, smaller, more granular surprises that fans may find in the book are, you know, for one, how important zombie animals were. I did a lot of research into uh, George, George's uh, sort of ideas, deleted scenes, things he cut out of films, and it showed me how much he was interested in exploring the idea of zombie animals. And once I sort of figured that out, the idea of animals 
led directly to the grander idea that guides the book of that humans, that the, we always call it the zombie plague, but that's wrong. Humans are the plague and zombies are the antibodies in a sense that are sent hmm. to earth to wipe out the human plague and more or less save the planet. Um, it, it, to some degree, you know, he, he was a really funny guy, much funnier than me. I'm not funny at all. <laughs> anything funny in this book, it's definitely him. Uh, but but it's also sad. It is ultimately sort of a, a sad book. I think he, uh, Sue's would be able to respond to this better than I am about like how much of an optimist or pessimist he was. But this book, I think, is sort of a pessimistic work. Um, I think to a degree, George thought we were goners. And so it it is sad in a sense. You know, I, um, first of all, it's a big book. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's a uh, intimidating size. And, uh, uh, I sat down and, um, I, I read it. Uh, it was, um, an emotional experience for me. Um, I had read bunches of it before, um, in fact, uh, the main character or one of the characters, Luis, I used to call George Luis when he was being, you know, uh, difficult or uh, or negative uh, because George, George, you know, was um, interestingly, interestingly enough, he was a half empty kind of guy. The glass is half empty, but really deep down, he was all about full. <laughs> so he was a dichotomy and um but he often looked at life uh in a in a in a negative or pessimistic uh view and uh this book uh, reflects that i have to say uh like i said it was emotional i cried i i was touched by the characters i um i felt that dan was the best person to write this book um i was thrilled and I was nervous. I wouldn't like it, but I actually loved it. It's 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 fun. It's it's exactly what the fans are going to want to to read. And uh, it, it, and the and the prose. It's just beautiful. And uh, I've congratulated Dan uh, for his work. Um, it, it just. The two authors, you know, had two different styles, but were able. It was. Dan was able to knit it together, and um, uh, I think we're both proud of it. I think it's going to be fantastic. It's still yeah. still hearing that for me makes me want to uh, cry. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm pretty it's, early on in the in the book so far, but I, I think that there's a there's a comforting presence to uh, George's voice. And I think that that really carries through in this it novel. Does. It um, does. You know, even though it's it's you know his works are sometimes pessimistic, I do think that there's a, a comfort and a, a humanity overall to his works that I, I really really comes through in this novel. Um, in terms of his filmography, it was very versatile. I just did a rewatch of all of his films uh, over the past week, and even though he was best known for his zombie films, he had a lot of other interests. Um, and, you know, a couple of my favorites that weren't zombie films are um, Martin and uh, Knight Riders in particular. I find a really uh, touching uh, film that was kind of outside of the, the horror box for him. Uh, did any of that impact uh, the writing of this book at all? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think one of the reasons that uh, I appealed to uh, George's manager, Chris Rowe, as a co-author was uh, he knew me as a real, a real student of George's, uh, and not, and I don't mean a student of his zombie films. I just mean a student. Period. Uh, I was a, I. How else can I say it? I was. Just, I grew up on his movies, and I loved all of them. I don't think he ever made a bad movie. And so, part of my, my research for the book was by no means limited to his zombie films to give it an idea of who he was as a, a creator and as a thinker. I really had to look at everything he did, the wide breadth of it, and there's quite a bit. And, you know, there are nods, sort of Easter egg type nods to all of his work in the in the novel, not just his, his zombie work. Those are pretty subtle. 
uh, some of them you only the super fan will know to will notice. But but really, yeah, I can't I can't emphasize enough how how important it is to look beyond the obvious six movies when it came to writing this book list. Suze, if I remember uh, correctly, Romero, in terms of his own film watching habits, he was pretty interested in things outside of horror, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> classic yeah, film, a, right? Yes, uh, just about everything but horror, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he had a very diverse uh, 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 interest in, cine in cinema. Um, he loved classics, and when he met me, he felt that I was completely deprived of uh, any uh, of film knowledge. So I went to school for about twelve <laughs> years. <laughs> so I, uh, I even, and you know, he accused me of being, you know, because you know he really liked boy movies. You know, he liked monster movies and he liked Stuart Granger and swashbuckling films and he loved uh, westerns. Um, so it took a little for me to get into those films, uh, but he finally convinced me they're worthy. <laughs> so uh, yeah. And you know, I when I met George, I didn't know who he was. And, um, and about three or four months into our relationship, he said to me, um, I guess it's time for you to see my movies. <laughs> okay, sure. And so uh, we spent a weekend doing a Romero Film Festival. And I was sitting next to Maestro uh, for uh, three days. And uh, I, I look back at it and I would think, oh my goodness, how many people would have been so envious of yeah. me and being with him and watching all the movies and and him telling me the stories and the things he hated and the things he liked and the things I hated, the things I liked. Um, it was uh, it was a great three days. It was uh, 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 I, 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 I finally a, a glimpse as to uh, why people thought he was a, a great filmmaker. I did not know, but I do now. Did he go through his films in order? You know, he did it because he, he, we were having trouble procuring some of them. Mm. <laughs> so, so eventually we got it all. And, um, and so I, you know, they were in sequence, uh, but I have seen them since in sequence. Um, uh, but at, at that film festival, it was, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, I think we watched dawn, night, dawn, day, you know, mm. uh, and so it was the little films that we were having. He didn't have any of his films. He had to buy them. <laughs> he had to buy his movies. So anyway. Did he have a, a favorite of his that he'd made? Uh, he loved Martin. There is no doubt about that. It was his favorite film. And one of the reasons he loved that film was because he got to shoot frame by frame absolutely everything he wanted to do. Um, as a director, uh, to have full sovereignty uh, from beginning to end is so rare. And uh, he got that opportunity as an artist to, to do the film he wanted to do. And he, um, he loved it. What about uh, you guys' favorite Romero moments in film? Are there any <laughs> standouts across his filmography? I'm sure there are a lot. <laughs> Dad, that's a loaded question. <laughs> there's a lot. I mean, there's a, a couple that kind of jump to mind, uh, both from his zombie movies. But uh, I, I mean, I could go on and on, obviously. But there's a there's a great moment in Dawn where uh, it's Fran and uh, Flyboy. I don't remember what his real name is, but they call him Flyboy. Mm -hmm. And they're they're in bed together, and it's after they've sort of cleaned out the mall of zombies and they're just sort of living high on the hog and they have everything they want. And yet they're sitting in bed and they're not looking at each other. And it's just the sort of slow zoom out, I think. And it just sort of shows you that even after you, have you've won everything that you think you've won everything, you still could have nothing. Um, that there's something very, very, 
nasty about that as, as far as mm-hmm. uh, the American dream or what it's supposed to be. And then, of course, one of my favorite Romero images of all time is the very last image from his very last film, Survival of the Dead, which I, I think agree. is the most underrated movie. The I agree. final image is two white men, white men standing on a hill, both dead, both with guns that don't have any more bullets, and they're still just sitting there firing empty chambers at each other. Uh, they're still pulling triggers, even after mm-hmm. everything that's worth fighting for is gone. They're still trying to fight. They're still fighting. Uh, that that last image gives me chills, and I know George wanted to make a lot more movies, but mm-hmm. if you had to end on an image that, that sums up so much of what he made movies about, that, that one is so potent. I totally agree. I also think the end, the ending of Night uh, of the Living Dead is um, it still gives me the goosebumps. It's just so powerful, and it's still powerful. Um, it's the it's just everything. It's the music. It's the 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 sense of despair. I, it's just um, even to this day, it, it's very very powerful. Um, you know and. Uh, as a filmmaker, you you do your first film and it's a home run. <laughs> it's so, you know, like how how does that happen? Uh, but he got um, he made a a, a classic film, um, and it it changed the horror world, right? Like right then and there. So suddenly they weren't monsters, or the humans were the monsters now, mm-hmm. and uh, for the first time. And um, and just a, one little movie, uh, small budget, you know, ragtag team uh, makes a, a phenomenal film and uh, still impactful. And the fact that uh, he changed monsters, so it's um, it was um, it's uh, seminal. It's um, you know. And I, survival, Jesus, nobody sees this movie, but it's really terrific. I agree. And and another thing that uh, you you get a real sense of is every film has its own little look, you know, it has its own, it's its own world. And every film has, you know, uh, um, a unique uh, hit. And um, and he would always complain that people wanted him to do Dawn again. Like they always want me to do Dawn, but he insisted that every film was going to be different. Um, it would have a, pr- a footprint, but it would be different. One of the things that I, I noticed in the book, and I'm still early on, but um, your choice of characters. One of the the leads is a a, a black woman and. There's also a Muslim girl. And I think, you know, for me personally, my entryway into uh, Romero was Ben and Night of the Living Dead. And I think that's the film of his that I've seen the most. And it's the one that I think about the most just because of its its social significance. So in your choosing of the characters, I know some of that was probably already uh, written in Romero's notes, but, you know, was that something that you were really conscious of when you were writing of kind of creating a, a world that reflected our own with, with the lead characters. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I saw, I'm, I'm the same as you as I saw Night of the Living Dead, you know, five or six years old and then continually as a kid and growing up. And, you know, I lived in Iowa, you know, as a small kid, I didn't know any black people, but yet my hero was Ben, you mm-hmm. know, and that, that can't be overemphasized how, how important representation is to, to people more than me, but but to me too, in the sense that it wasn't He Man, it wasn't Batman. My hero was Ben. No last name, Ben. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, some of that George did in the book, but you know, and you'll get to this in the sort of the third section of the book. But there's, you know, 15 years after the zombie uh, apocalypse, there's sort of an attempt to recreate society and try to find a. a to try to see if utopia is possible. And I think that can, even in the abstract, that can only be possible if we upend the uh, the world as it is now. So what the people in the book, the, the, the one utopia that seems possible is one that 
led by people of every color and creed and orientation. And that, you know, in the beginning of the book, the world is as it is now. But by the end, uh, when various characters sort of come together, there's this, you know, there's this potential of a new world order, uh, a, a better world. Um, and I think it's sort of what George was coming to, beginning with Dwayne Jones playing Ben, all the way through the films, I think he was, he was, all paths were leading to what, how this book finishes up, I think. You know, George was uh, literally um, uh, colorblind. You know, he, you know, he was, um, he grew up in the Bronx and, you know, he was chided for being, uh, I don't even know what they call Puerto Ricans, but, uh, you know, so he would have trouble uh, with that being a Latino. Um, but personally, he was a person who couldn't care less who you were, how much money you had, it was totally irrelevant to him. He would be as respectful to the uh, chambermaid as he would to a Queen Elizabeth. I mean, there was just no difference. Um, he was, uh, uh, he couldn't understand. He, could, he just basically couldn't understand why people would have a problem with that. And he kept saying, it's, 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 you know, it's 1968. Why, why are people still having trouble with this? And now we're in 2020 and we're still having trouble with this. Uh, so his point of view was we should have sort of sorted it all out already. And we have it. Um, and uh, that's why he had such a pessimistic point of view because he kept thinking, Jesus, we're not getting it. We are not getting it. So, and he'd hammer it. I mean, he wasn't, he was subtle about it, right? I mean, he wasn't like in your face about it, but he, the way he wrote, he just kept hammering the point that we needed to stick together and yet we couldn't do that somehow. And, and it's a theme that goes through his, all of his films and, uh, and you know, and diversity is where we live. <laughs> this is our world. This, our world is diverse and this is where we live. And yet we somehow have trouble with it. So it's, uh, it's sad. Yeah. I, I've been oh, I hear a dog. Is that your dog, Dan? <laughs> no? It's my dog. <laughs> well, it's your dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been thinking a lot about Romero this year in particular, you know, just with, the pandemic and you know the current uh, racial situation in America, and I think that you know the the photos that we've seen, you know, going back to um, people protesting the the closing of businesses uh, and stores, and you know people's faces pressed up against the windows, mm -hmm. they drew comparisons to uh, Romero's works, and uh, I, I can't help but but think what he would what he would think about everything that's happening this year. Well, uh, I have to say, I, I, I promised him I would keep him posted on all things goings on, and I have. And um, uh, he, uh, he would have been not surprised at all. Um, he would probably do, be doing some writing right now. <laughs> um, you know, I think he... Uh, I think he could he would have predicted this don't you think dan like he totally in fact he he's written uh, about this so yeah yeah we're seeing a lot of scenes that yeah that as was saying that seems blocked straight from george's movies yeah, yeah. We're, li we're living in his head right now <laughs> we are definitely living in his head yeah he wouldn't have, and he wouldn't have wished that upon anyone no <laughs> In fact, he never really touched upon, you know, how pe how do people pay their bills and mortgages and groceries, and you know, he never touched upon that. He just sort of looked at it in a big on a on a much bigger swath, you know, of uh, of a uh, point. But um, but yeah, he he definitely uh, same thing with social media. By the way, he thought it was going to be our demise. He thought social media was basically evil and he was very much against it. Yeah, there's a, 
there's an early point in the book where everyone's looking down at their gadgets and yeah. uh, it's yeah. and it's the idea is that they're all just in the same way people shuffled around the mall like zombies mm. people were walking walking down the streets in the book no one looking at the the world going on around them everyone sort of behaving like zombies by just staring at their gadgets so in a sense we were already zombies mm -hmm. the uh the crazies is also something that's really uh come to me recently that's one that i i re uh when all of this started mm -hmm. and you know, the, the way that the the government handles uh you know the response to, to people afraid for their lives in the quarantine i thought that he really hit home uh with that and you know speaking about his his pessimism i mean that that ending is 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 really powerful that's a gut punch i think yeah if people out there haven't seen romero's the crazies yeah I mean, now is the time you got to yeah. you got to see it yeah it's uh, excellent yeah yeah he uh he had a knack right Don, Dan yeah. of uh, he, he just it's almost like he um he had an innate uh sense of he had a sense of every decade and the problems the decades brought uh and um he uh, and he always used the zombies as the metaphor but he wrote lots of stuff not just zombies he wrote uh we have an archive full of stories treatments uh just a whole sense of uh of his overall capacity uh to write and what he wrote about uh it's um it's very rich in in scope um yeah so the archive the archive is at the hillman library in pittsburgh uh of course it's where it belongs so um but it's just great that as an artist that all of his work is there uh protected and um and uh, and as diverse as the world is you know his work is diverse it's not just horror are there, is there any chance that we'll see any of those uh, unrealized projects come to fruition in some form? Uh, I, uh, Dan, in your book, there's a whole list of of projects that he was attached to at one point, and it, I, I knew some of them, but I was really blown away by the scale and scope of that. Yeah, in, in a sort of a pessimistic book, it's almost the most depressing page in the book <laughs> because it's uh, like a full page of yeah. made projects that he uh, you know, was attached to, or wrote, and never got made. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's hard to look at that stuff because he he wrote so much and he made relatively so little. Uh, and the archive that uh, Suze has spoken of is just filled with treasure troves. I think when people finally start to understand within that archive, their understanding of George is going to broaden tremendously. There's a lot of horror there, but there's a lot of stuff that's not horror. Uh, there's uh, there's something in there called Gun Person, which is this all women western. There's uh, there's it, it's not a finished script, but it's like a partly written script about local Pittsburgh wrestlers. I mean, there, anything you can think of. Like he had his he had his uh, his interests were so varied. Mm -hmm. Definitely. What do you think that he would think about the the popularity of zombies today. I mean, clearly he's always cited as an influence and he saw some of that take off with uh, The Walking Dead and, you know, a couple remakes of his films, uh, Dawn of the Dead and then Shaun of the Dead and 28 Days Later, he was kind of, you know, saw the beginning of that resurgence. But I mean, it's, it's so popular now and so many things can be traced back to George Romero. Uh, do you think that he'd have any insider opinion on Kind of the fascination or focus on that now? He'd say, yeah. <laughs> you know, he didn't get it really at the end, but I, I think he understood that people like to dress up and um and it's uh it's a it's it's easy to be ugly, you know, as a zombie. Um, um but uh yeah, I, people used to ask him that all the time, you know, did you ever imagine that this film this first film that you did would create this, you know, uh, thing. And 
No, there's the answer is no, he totally didn't. And, uh, you know, he just, uh, you know, he used to be the only guy in the sandbox, as he used to say, you know, so, uh, so that sandbox is obviously uh, expanded quite a bit. And uh, I have to tell you a story. So George and I were on our terrace and we were having a barbecue, but it was interrupted because we had to do a phoner uh, from Czechoslovakia. And they were doing a zombie walk there. And there were about 13,000 people. And he could hear them on the phone, you know. And, you know, and it was just 15 minutes of 13,000 zombies and people excited about speaking to George on the speaker in the square. Um, it's surreal. It, it, it was surreal to him. You know, it was like. Okay, wow. But kind of cool. I think he would never yeah. admit it, but he, <laughs> he thought it was kind of cool, but he never mentioned it. Hmm. You know, yeah. he never mentioned it. I mean, I think <clears throat> there's, he was probably much more keyed into the other elements of it, you know, not so much the, uh, the idea of a certain kind of monster, but more the, uh, stories he wanted to tell and just the conduit mm -hmm. which he was given you know he sort of stumbled into this thing and to a large extent that's what people sort of he might have created a subgenre but then he also sort of got stuck in it i mean that was yeah. what people wanted him to be uh but his i think his influence is far far greater than just come just sort of reinventing the idea of a zombie uh, you know he at a young age, his movies taught me what a metaphor was, just still as a kid, you know, maybe seeing Don. Uh, and I think his filmography might, might very well might be the greatest example in film history of a body of work that horror can matter. Hmm. Um, I don't, it, horror, can be shocking and grotesque in a way that can wake people up to the world around them that I don't know that other genres uh, can do quite as startlingly. And uh, George was the prime, prime mover of that. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. One of the, the films that I, I really took notice of uh, was one of his later ones, Diary of the Dead. And I think, uh, you know, you look at that now and it's talking about the news cycle and omitting facts. And, you know, it was almost like he could foresee the, the entire fake news situation that we have today. And so it's really interesting because, you know, zombies are the vehicle through which he explored this, but he's really talking about, you know, something much larger. And I think that it was really interesting at that late stage of his career, not only did he evolve in his filmmaking techniques, you know, jumping to found footage, but also just how he explored uh, our world and, and modern media, I think it's, is quite fascinating. You know, he, um, he thought that social media would enhance tribalism and it's exactly what happened. You know, everybody has their, their, uh, their news source. Uh, they don't go outside of that news source because that news source uh, provides them with the the uh, the aspect that they want to hear, so uh, as social media people tweeting and doing all of that stuff just uh, it, it engages other people to their that are like minded. There's no more discourse. Um, it's all camps. You know, they, them, we, they. You know, it's all about that. And uh, he thought that social media would in fact, um, accelerate it and emphasize it. And that's exactly what it is, I think. Uh, I, I'm not a big uh, social media person, but I do realize that it's how people communicate with each other now. Um, but, we, but it's a weapon and, um, uh, and we have to be very careful with it. Or it can be weaponized. Yeah. Just, yeah, it can be weaponized. It's not necessarily a weapon, but it can be weaponized, and it is weaponized. Yeah. I think that, you know, we can see uh, George Romero's influence and legacy in so many 
forms. And I think it's it's great that, you know, with this novel, it's like he's he's continuing to to give us stories and to give us insight. Um, so, you know, is there is there anything else coming down uh, the pipeline from the Romero Foundation or from you, Dan, uh, in terms of your writing that, you know, gives us a little bit more uh, Romero? There's always, you know, something <laughs> on the corner. But we've signed a gag order. We can't say <laughs> anything. <laughs> is, there any, is there anything you can talk about, Suze, or maybe at least the, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, boiling, uh, you know, in pots. Um, I take a lot of phone calls and sign a lot of shopping agreements, but, uh, but, you know, we'll see. Um, my, my job is to uh, protect his legacy as to protect him and his work. Uh, that's what I do at the foundation, other than also giving some scholarships and, and you know, stuff. But, um, but my main job is to make sure that George's legacy remains elevated and, uh, and cherished. Um, so all the work that will come in the future will, I hope, reflect that. And, um, uh, you know, we'll have to see it, uh, you know, it, it, it takes a uh, it takes a lot to get work done these days, and uh, especially good work. So we have to be just judicious, and um, and yet we realize that uh, there's a lot of people who want to see more of his work, and I, and I think we we will. I think we shall see. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, the list <laughs> is. Uh, a great uh, example of that, uh, and it's a, it's a quite a hefty tome, so I think that it'll keep our it fans busy for a while. Yeah, I think in some degree, to some degree, he wanted this to be not a conversation stopper necessarily, but it's you know it really does sort of close the loop that he began with *Night of Living Dead*. Yeah, and and and, and not only is it uh, smart because it's a very smart book, but it's fun. It's a it's a fun book. Um, it has a lot of uh, action, and it has a lot of great characters, and um, and even for somebody like me who's not particularly fond of that kind of uh, uh, of literature necessarily, I loved it. So I think people are in for a big treat. Great. And I I really like the nuggets in there. <laughs> All those little nuggets are are so much fun. And the book comes out August 4th this year, right? Yep. And it's available for pre-order now. Um, I'm I'm loving reading it. Um, I'm I'm about a hundred pages in, and okay. I'm a fan, I gotta say, I'm I'm very excited to to see where the story goes. It's it's a yeah. great. It's great. Good go. Yeah. Well, thank you both for being here for this panel. Um, feels odd to ask for uh, social media handles given. <laughs> George Romero's opinion on that, I have to ask. Uh, is there any place that uh, you guys want to give to viewers that they can follow you or see what's going on with the Romero Foundation? Well, just the, go to the Foundation's website. Uh, we're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Uh, so, yeah, keep an eye on what's going on there. And I personally don't because uh, I'm, you know, I, I have um, – um, people who do that for me, but because um, I have zero interest. <laughs> uh, I barely have, I have a phone. <laughs> I have a phone. So, um, but the foundation is, uh, has all of it. So, and, and Dan, you're, you're in the, you've got the Twitter thing going, right? Yeah. Um, for, for information on me, the easiest way is just go to danielkraus.com spelled like that. <laughs> and, uh, It'll have links to all the other things that I do. Great. Great. Thank you guys both for being here. Uh, Thanks, Richard. Words of George Romero, stay scared. Stay scared and stay yep. safe. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.